Hello everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel. In this upload, I am going to be having a conversation with a very special guest indeed, my mother. When it comes to requested themes for my content on the channel, I think speaking to my mom has to be up there in the top three. So I'm really happy to have her uh, this morning. I, she doesn't have all the time in the world, so the conversation will last as long as she allows, but I'm absolutely thrilled to be talking to her this morning. So I'm going to do that in just a moment. Before I do that, I have to say thank you to everybody. I see the numbers are climbing. Last time I checked, it was about 160 something, uh, not 100, 860 something subscribers. So I'm really appreciative of that um, thank you to everybody who shares my videos with your friends and whoever for liking for commenting and all of that and if you like my content but you haven't subscribed yet please do consider doing so every subscriber is highly valued and much appreciated so let's just get into the conversation without further ado i'll start mum thank you for joining me this morning hello one of the things i, I want to start with is the fact that um, I was introduced to the ideas to authors like Neville Goddard, Florence Scovel Shin, Danaikin, and all of those kinds of people at a very early age. But I was aware, even though I didn't understand what you were saying, I was aware that this was something that was really important to you, that this was something that mattered to you a great deal. So can you tell me a bit about where it all began for you, even though I know the story, I just want to share this with the audience. What was your first foray, if you like, into the world of metaphysical thought? I first um, learned to use my imagination when I was young. I found that I could think of things, imagine things, and they would happen. And that really helped me because as a child, I, I, was, I met with an accident and I was often on my own. And I, no one was there to talk to me, play with me, and there was, there was an opportunity for me, just provided naturally, for me to use my imagination. And that was what changed things for me. As I recovered and I began going to school, I used to walk past this family in this this house, which was really a little uh, mini. Oh, Mum, so we're going to talk about that in a, in a moment. So just to say a bit more, you said that as a child, when you were alone, you were able to use your imagination. Um, what was that like for you? What, what do you mean by use your imagination? Well, because I was on my own, I had no, no one to talk to, I used to think things, think about things. But rather than just thinking about things, I used to actually be able to understand things. Because when I thought of something, I would get a feeling that I knew what I was talking about. Did you see um, pictures in your mind? Did you smell things, taste things? So what, what did that look like? For me as a child, um, maybe to be a bit clearer, I would spend countless hours going to what I called fairyland and what fairyland was I would just close my eyes and I'd be in a place with rolling green hills and everything was beautiful fruit on the trees beautiful flowers birds singing overhead and all of that kind of thing and I could do anything so I was a princess and you were the queen of fairyland and anything I had a magic wand and anything I wanted I could just flick my magic wand and there that thing would appear so these were very vivid pictures in my mind it was something I experienced you know emotionally without realizing what was going on so for you what was using your imagination like I think my using my imagination was very much like that I began to see things and I would picture myself doing things and I picture myself being in different places and somehow I got there and I, don't, I couldn't tell you what happened, but just I felt, oh my goodness, this was really using the imagination, seeing something and actually being with that thing. And so the, vo the, the kind of understandings and the expressions that I was getting when I was using my imagination really encouraged me to continue. So you spoke about earlier on um, the fact that you would walk past a particular house um, on your way to school so before just to give a bit of context to that you grew up in um, in poverty like so many people um, on a farm which i think is fan fantastic by the way but <laughs> for you with the animals and all the hard work i don't know that that was um heaven on earth but you grew up on this farm and then you used to walk quite a distance to school and tell us what happened um during that time Yes, I used to walk three miles to school. <laughs> oh, mind you, we got used to it, so it didn't feel like anything. But all, I used to always pass this house. 
and I won't say the name of the people because I think they might still be there. <laughs> I don't know. But the house was unbelievable. We lived in a shack and they lived in a palace. It was so beautiful. And I used to pass it and I used to imagine that I lived in that house. And I don't know how long, how long it took, but within a year, I was living in a house like that in Montego Bay. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't explain to anyone that I'd been here before, but I had. I do remember growing up and you telling us that story and you would notice them in their chauffeur driven car and their beautiful clothes and all that kind of thing. And you were, you know, this rough tom tomboy in the burlap sack. I'm only joking, that's a, a slight exaggeration, but and I know um, Grandma K Kitty took great uh, care of you, but it was just this idea that you would see a particular life. And so did you picture yourself having that life? Because I know you ended up being chauffeur driven as well. Yes, I, I really pictured, I wondered what it would be like. <laughs> that's <laughs> what I wanted. And when I found myself being taken to school in a car, everything we did we were chauffeur driven we had really fantastic maids that one did the washing one did the <laughs> cooking one did our hair it was quite amazing how you know they wouldn't give us our showers and everything oh i couldn't just believe it but there we were living how i thought they lived isn't that incredible and this is what we're talking about we don't know how it happens i know some people try to offer explanations but neville said there is no explanation all we are required to do is to consent, as I've said in one of my uploads, to this being the case. And you did that as a child. And this really um, translated throughout your entire life. You also told us a story about how you came to be in England. Uh, when you used to look at the planes flying overhead. Can you tell me a bit about that? Um, that's, that's my biggest joke, because when I saw airplanes flying above, I used to say to, to the adults around, oh, I'm going to go in that next week. <laughs> and, you know, they'll get a thrashing <laughs> because I was making stories up. But I kept saying it, I kept saying it. And one day I was sitting on an aeroplane going to England with my lovely colourful straw hat. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> because I knew what f being on an aeroplane was like in my imagination. And there I was in reality. So... I mean that's absolutely sensational this is this is very much what i'm all about folks people talk ask me all the time okay can you tell me a bit about your experience and i don't necessarily want to point to jobs i have attained or things that i've done i know that kind of thing inspires people but it's a whole life thing it, it's not something you do here and there it's the way you are it's the way you conduct yourself throughout life that's what i'm trying to drive that's the message i'm trying to drive home with my content, when I'm engaging with people, when I'm talking to clients, it's not about something you do as a person every now and then, it is how you are. And I see that exclusivity, living um, by imagination in the way that you have done. And that's something that I emulated at an early age and that's what I do now. So fast forward, you're in England and you're having a, a whale of a time. We won't go through that too much. But at 14, you are looking at yoga but and I think am I correct in saying this is around about the time that you were very much involved at Church of England and, and Father Rillingworth and all the wonderful um kind of English village stuff <laughs> but in the midst of all of that and I and I'm not talking about that part of your life per se but you know Father Illingworth and all them they were a really important part of your life and I'm, I'm not asking you to talk about these people but in the midst of being now in a new environment with new people, some of them very supportive, you're still looking at yoga. What was the motivation for that? Well, <clears throat> I would say that the church has always been in my life somewhere. But when I, when I got to my dear father in Lingworth that you keep mentioning, he had a fantastic library. I couldn't believe it. And he had so many different authors, different types of books. He had a book about yoga as well. Oh boy, and I borrowed that and I went home and I gobbled that one up and I thought, wow, this was magic, real magic for me, where you could be in your mind and seeing the things you see and having the, the strength, the power, the clarity that you had. Oh, yoga changed my life because it allowed me 
to develop the part of me that I had not developed properly when I was a child. So the sense I get from that is that here you have a text that is putting into language what you were feeling and experiencing. Is that correct? That's exactly what it was. It actually allowed you to use your imagination. It allowed you to see yourself in an open space Whereas before, you would just carry on doing everyday things and not thinking about there was another alternative to being happy, being in a pleasurable place, and that I really loved. So I really went into it, and I've got my own books from the library, and I bought my own books to really make something of it. Absolutely fantastic, and, and it's something, you know, these sorts of exercises are something that you introduced us to as well. So we've been really, really fortunate in just in the wealth of uh, ideas, topics, themes, whatever it is that you've introduced to us and then fast forward you met daddy, daddy was in Russia, he came back, you got married, you had all of the experiences that you had and then you started to have us and as children um, we're very young, here we are and you are introducing us, your babies, to these ideas. What was the end goal for you? What was the purpose of introducing us to these ideas? Wow, I think I, I didn't have an end goal, but I had this burning desire to share what I knew with my children. I had to tell them what I knew, what my experience of life had been and how their lives could be different, not just ordinary, but they could be access this other world that I lived in. One of the things I do remember you talking about was this um, notion that we had to make a contribution. You really drilled that down. That was something we heard from daddy a lot as well. Another thing you said, you didn't want us to be object referred. You wanted us to look at life in a different way about what we were adding to it rather than the um, acquisition of goodies and accoutrement. What was that all about? This idea, this message of make a contribution, make a contribution. Well, I wanted to get you all to realize that we are all part of this thing not just people growing up and some going off to do what they want and doing what they want we were all part of something that i couldn't put my finger on it I st at that point i hadn't put my finger on it yet but <clears throat> by actually being aware of what you're doing in the world you begin to make a contribution for instance as children i wanted you all to learn to read very very early so you could actually read and discover that other people are doing other things with life not just going to school, coming home, going to church. That wasn't life in its fullness. People were in the world doing other things. People were going abroad as doctors. They were going as scientists and doing lots of things. And you know, me and my science and my maths, <laughs> I couldn't, couldn't help you all to actually, I um, could prevent you, you know, hold you back from knowing these subjects because these subjects were not beyond you because they were things that you imagined and they happened. And I knew that. Another thing that was really interesting about the experience of life as you described it to us was this idea that some people seem to have a lot and others seem to have nothing. And that seemed to be the prescription. If you were told, if you were labeled in a particular way and given a certain set of, of rules to live by, and not just rules, if you were told, okay, this is the box you exist in and, and there you shall live, r remain and, and eventually die. You wanted us to know that, no, we didn't have to follow the prescription of life given to us, that we were very much in control of our own experience and brought us into an understanding of the fact that children were experiencing tremendous things, not just your own experience of life, which was very, very hard, but you have children in war zones and children caught up in all kinds of things like the, the child protection services and all kinds of, of things that if then life would be very hard life would be very unjust if there was no remedy to that kind of thing and i feel very much that this introducing us to the power of imagination in a meaningful way was um a way of addressing that kind of thing is that correct that's quite correct because if you remember what i always wanted you all to be able to do is to see why things were happening I, I couldn't tell you why they were but by using your imagination and seeing something that looks terrible as not the end as just a, a, an opportunity for you to think of something else yeah like neville that's, talks about this the solution is in the problem that's exactly how i wanted you all 
when you, you look at going to school and especially how children were treated, certain children were not given the, the kind of opportunities that other children were. But I'm saying that no one has to give you the opportunities. You could give them to yourself. That is absolutely, I think that's the standout for me, that we have this resource that we can make our lives what we want it to be despite all appearances. Now, just thinking about us as kids, um, I just want to slip this in. I certainly remember that the day to hear from you was Sunday afternoon. So we'd come home from church. We'd have the, the ministers on the pulpit telling us what they were telling us. We had Sunday school, all of that. Be a good girl, be a good boy, and Jesus will be happy with you, and you'll go to heaven when you die. And if you don't, you're going to go to hell when you die, and that kind of thing. And yet that was the day you chose to talk to us about these alternative ideas. And I don't want to call them alternative ideas because of what they mean to me now, but then that's the way it seemed. Why that day? What was so special about talking to us on a Sunday after church, particularly? Um, I became very aware of this idea that there was only one root on this earth. I became very aware that as children, you were being asked to do something that I didn't believe in. When I say believe in it, I couldn't say that is right because I did the opposite to what some of the things that I was told and I still made life a wonderful thing for myself so but on that day you were all so open you were all so shiny eyed and you would love you love the stories because the, the way i would make it with the meal and the, the time to sit together and hear me reading i wanted to introduce you all to what other people have said other people who know that there is more to what they have been told we're being told yes I guess. that's the alternative there's another interpretation of what we're experiencing yeah and I, I certainly got the impression that it was about um us taking the lead in terms of what our relationship to god was what our understanding of god was what our understanding of life was so it, it wasn't about avoiding particular points of view but being exposed to as many as possible with um and thereby giving us the option to make those choices for ourselves i think that's what you were were driving at is, is that it that's what exactly it now i'm i've always been a person like this if someone says to me this is the only way to do something for some unknown reason i will never accept that i want to do things the opposite way they said to do it and come to the same conclusion <laughs> so they can't be telling me everything they're not i'm not saying that they're not telling me the truth that's the way they saw it but the way i saw it and i had this a, this capacity I don't want to call it ability it sounds like it's different from other people everyone has this capacity to see something else no matter how they would put it this is the way and you will be punished and this I said to myself why would you be punished and then I'll get the answer now the alternative is that you don't have to be to suffer things you can change things yes we have the resources to make life what we want them to be so thinking going back then to us around the dinner table yes we were all looking up at you adoringly but you commented and my dad commented as well about the fact that this information seemed to have an impact on me that it didn't have on my siblings taking nothing from them we all embraced it but you observed that I seem to have a particular interest um, in what um, you were saying then. What did you notice about me back then? Well, I noticed the the way you were very, um, what's it, insular. You just thought about how you could do the things that I was doing. I could see that on your little face that you, as if to say that you wanted to check me out. Is it telling us the truth? But really, what was wonderful is that when you actually saw that you could do something, like like when I got that hamster, you remember the hamster? You know, no one could stop you from then on. You were a different person because you you said to me, I want a hamster. And I said, well, how are you going to get this hamster? <laughs> and then you applied what you knew. And there you were sitting with a hamster on your lap. How on earth did this little child, were you six at the time? I think so, yeah. You got this hamster by using your imagination you were a different child in that respect that everything else, and what else do you say to me and what about this and this girl did me this and this child did me this and no one does anything to you how would you see that differently and you came home oh my gosh your experience in life was completely different even your teachers was 
were uh, actually talking to you. Why are you so different? I, I do remember that because I was a child um, and daddy says all the time, I, of all his children, I was the one who spent time on my own. And my friends were within the covers of books and my ambition as a result of that was to be an author and I'm an author now. Um, but there are so many other things that I've done. I wanted to travel and then I find myself traveling. I want to go to Switzerland and the next thing I know I'm being invited. I want to go to the States and I'm being invited. Th that's just the way it is because of this living in imagination. And I, I think I said it earlier on that it's not something you do as a person, but it was a recognition that this is who you are and how you are. And our entire duty is to live like this. And that's the message I'm really trying to drive home. This is our duty. It's our duty to live this way. This is not about um, practices that you use to make your human life better. It, I th I've said, I think it was one of my earliest interviews or blogs or whatever it was, that we need to flip the, the script. We need to change our perspective on things. And I think that's what's different about you and I in that this living by imagination, as people say, is not about manifesting as human beings, but living exclusively by imagination. I think what you are touching on there is something really dear to my heart, is who are we really? Are we just objects or are we subjects of a higher order? Now, being a subject of a higher order, you do higher things. You remember that thing about the contribution? Mm -hmm. I said to you, the contribution you make, it's to humanity, not just the um, things around the house and the way you're doing things. You will interpret life in a way that other people will see something different about themselves and begin to apply this. Now, this contribution is valueless. You can't put a price on it. And that when a person recognizes that they have a superior existence, and they have been neglecting it and now they must live it to really enjoy life. Life has got something else to offer us. We haven't touched on it yet, mm. what it's all about. So that's where we are. So mom, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this conversation with you. I can see your eyes flicking towards the, the clock. But yeah, I think we've, we've touched on a number of things, giving people a bit more of an understanding about me. I mean, certainly people are curious about what it is about me that makes what I say and do different. And I, I really am confident that this conversation has shed some light on that. So I can't thank you again. I think I'm going to have to have you on the channel again, but just for now, um, thank you everybody for listening. This has been Kate Jagede talking with my beautiful mother and um, we'll be with you or I will be with you in the next upload. Thanks very much, mum. Goodbye. Thank you very much, Catherine.